December 2008. Bernie Madoff is in a panic. Thousands of people want to cash out of his investment firm. However, he doesn't have the money. A lot of the money never even existed, and the money that did exist was given to earlier investors. His brokerage empire was nothing but a Ponzi scheme decades in the making. The untold damage that he has caused will lead to suicides, investigations, lawsuits, government agency reforms, and financial ruin for thousands of victims. Bernie Madoff is born on April 29, 1938, in Queens, New York. He begins his career when he starts Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities, a brokerage firm, in 1960. It's unclear when exactly he started doing it, but he decided that it would be a good idea to use his company and notoriety and organize a Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme is pretty much a scam in which people invest in a business, or in this case, a brokerage firm. This business is not real. Money from newer investors is used to pay off older investors who decide to cash out, and the ringleader gets a cut. It gives the illusion of money being made when in actuality money is just being taken and moved around. It's pretty much just a secret pyramid scheme. It works pretty well. However, because it's reliant on newer investors, it's extremely unstable. If the infinite flow of investment stops or too many people want their money back at once, it quickly collapses. The scheme is uncovered, the ringleader goes to jail, and the bottom layers of the pyramid are left with nothing. Why exactly you would want to do this? I don't know. Madoff's company promises low risk and high reward with little to no effort from its customers. His returns are over 10% and extremely consistent. His competitors get nowhere close to matching him. As an explanation for his incredible returns, he claims to be using a method called split strike conversion, which is an actual investing strategy. He's basically buying a contract which gives him the opportunity to buy stock for a set amount. These are called call options. Uh, for example, he wants to buy FCMY or a fake company whose current price is $200. He buys the contract with an expiration date of, say, six months. If the value of the stock at four months is $250, he can still buy the stock for $200 because he has the contract. He's doing this with a bunch of companies that he and his team have picked out. I mean, not really. He's just saying that he is so that the feds don't come knocking. Now, it's a little suspicious, sure, but people trust Bernie. He was running a large investment firm, had a legitimate strategy, as far as they knew, and he had served as a NASDAQ chairman for three years, and I am not making that up. Well, not everyone trusts him. In the late 90s, Harry Markopoulos, an accountant, is a little suspicious. After looking at Madoff's financials, he immediately realizes that something doesn't add up. He does some math and proves that it doesn't add up. Markopoulos calls people who work at the Chicago Options Exchange. Nobody remembers trading with Madoff's company. On top of all that, if Madoff were actually using split-strike conversion, and if he was trading on the Chicago Options Exchange, he would have had to have purchased more options than were in existence. Reasonably, he concludes that Madoff is probably lying, and he wants the Securities and Exchange Commission about him. They don't listen. Marco Polis didn't even just do this once either. No, 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 no. He did this several times, years before 2008. The SEC just did not care. During all of this time, Madoff's operation has been expanding massively. He has a location in London, which he totally doesn't use to launder money, and billions of dollars have been entrusted to him and his company. Several high-profile people are investing. They include DreamWorks CEO Jeffrey Katzenberg, charitable Holocaust survivor Ellie Wiesel, who invested millions through his nonprofit, Kevin Bacon, Larry King, John Malkovich, Fred Wilpin, and Steven Spielberg. He even tries to get Donald Trump to invest, but he turns him down. Marco Polis is still warning the SEC, but they don't listen. Madoff is doing incredible. He and his company are making loads of money, and nobody's onto him. Except Marco Polis, of course, but nobody is listening to him. Although things are good at the moment, Bernie knows that Ponzi schemes are extremely unstable and that this can't go on forever. Let's just hope there isn't an economic crisis that would cause everyone to want to pull out at the same time. Uh-oh. Everyone's defaulting on their mortgage payments and now the economy is screwed. Subsequently, so is Madoff. People want out of the stock market and $7 billion has been requested. Now, that would be fine for a normal business, but because this is a Ponzi scheme, a lot of the money that was invested was already given to other previous investors. He has some money to give, but it's not nearly enough. This is, uh, not good, and knowing that he's in a less than ideal position, he confesses everything to his wife and sons. His sons, who are employed at Blemis, and I'm gonna call it Blemis from now on, almost immediately inform the FBI. On December 11th, 2008, federal agents arrive at Madoff's New York City apartment and arrest him. Thankfully, he is released on a $10 million bond. Billions of dollars are just 
gone, and on December 15th, Irving Picard is chosen to lead the recovery effort, along with the liquidation of Blemis and all of Madoff's assets. Picard and his partner, David Sheehan, are only expected to recover 5 to 10 cents on every dollar lost. Madoff had defrauded over 40,000 people in 125 different countries, and total losses are estimated to be $17.5 billion. The life savings of thousands of victims have been wiped out, including those of Ellie Wiesel, the Holocaust survivor mentioned before. Victims are losing their homes and filing for bankruptcy. Several foundations and charities that were invested are shutting down, one of which is the Pekauer Foundation ran by Jeffrey Pekauer, who will be talked about a little bit later. The thing is, there were many victims that were indirect investors. This means that they invested into a firm which then invested their money into Blemis. These are known as feeder funds. The owner of one such firm lost $1.4 billion in client and personal funds, and he slits his wrists in his office on December 22, 2008. Madoff has easily become the most hated man in America. On Christmas Eve, in an attempt to commit suicide, Bernie and his wife take a bunch of pills and go to bed. They both wake up the next morning. He faces 11 counts. Securities fraud, investment advisor fraud, mail fraud, wire fraud, intentional money laundering to promote specified unlawful activity, international money laundering to conceal and disguise the proceeds of specified unlawful activity, money laundering, false statements, perjury, making a false filing with the SEC, and theft from an employee benefit plan. One could argue that he's been quite naughty. The judge is inclined to agree. Madoff pleads guilty to all counts on March 12, 2009. For his crimes, Madoff is sentenced to 150 years in prison and is ordered to forfeit $170 billion. He requests to return back to his luxury penthouse. The request is denied by the judge who sends him immediately to jail. I wonder why. Okay, Madoff was punished, that's great, and the victims like that, but uh-oh. People are just learning that the SEC repeatedly ignored Marco Polis. They are, understandably, a little annoyed. The SEC goofs so badly, the government opens an investigation to see how the hell they didn't catch him. Apparently, the SEC had looked into Madoff on five separate occasions, saw that maybe something didn't add up, and just didn't do anything. The investigation ends and they find that nobody collaborated with Madoff. Their only crimes were either being inexperienced or just being straight up terrible at their jobs. Nobody was fired. Okay, Madoff is in prison, the SEC got into a little bit of trouble, but they still aren't happy yet. What else could they want? Hmm... Oh yeah. Madoff's assets have already been liquidated and some money was recouped from that, but billions of dollars are still missing. Blemis was a Ponzi scheme, so a lot of the money was given to somebody else, but who? Who exactly benefited from this and how much money did they get? This was a massive, massive fraud, and Picard and his team will have to go on a treasure hunt all across the world to find the missing billions. It'll be tough, but they intend on getting the money back. They aren't going after the small investors in the very beginning, but instead go after the big guys, the guys who made millions off of the scheme. Also Madoff's family. The largest profiteer, Jeffrey Picard, earned a modest $7.2 billion from the scheme. He drowns in 2009, and his wife agrees to give back the money. There were other large profiteers too, but Picard was the largest and most significant one. Some profiteers felt bad and kindly and willingly gave the money back, like Barbara Picard. However, many times, Picard and his team had to take it back. There were so, so many lawsuits against everyone under the sun, and I'm not even going to try to cover them all. They went after large profiteers in their estates, investment firms and feeder funds, banks, the IRS former employees and conspirators, the smaller investors, and others. Picard's quest for the missing billions could be a video on its own, and it would be a long one. All that really matters for the moment is that Picard and his team are filing lawsuits, forcing people to return assets, reaching settlements, and searching for the victim's money. Madoff's wife, Ruth, agrees to pay back $80 million in 2009. She gets to keep $2.5 million. Madoff insisted that he worked alone, but... How exactly does one operate and conceal the largest Ponzi scheme in history alone? Well, in short, one doesn't. He had help, and quite a bit. On August 11, 2009, Frank DePascali, Blemis' CFO, pleads guilty to 10 federal charges facing 125 years in prison. He forged fake financial and trading records for the company. He died in 2015 before facing punishment. On October 2nd, Irving Picard files a lawsuit against four different Madoff family members, all Blemis employees. 
Bernie's sons, Mark and Andrew, his brother, Peter, and his niece, Shanna. He's seeking nearly $199 million. Not sure why he didn't just round up, but you know. On November 3rd, David G. Freeling, Madoff's accountant, pleads guilty to nine federal charges. He passed Blumitz audits from 1991 to 2008. He faced 114 years in prison, but got one year of home detention and one year of supervised release after. Now that is a plea bargain if I've ever seen one. My goodness. On the second anniversary of his father's arrest, Mark Madoff hangs himself with a dog leash in his apartment. On June 29th, 2012, Peter Madoff, Bernie's brother and Bill Emmis' CEO, pleads guilty to two federal charges and is sentenced to 10 years in prison. He is released in 2019. Oh, we're not done yet, folks. Five former Madoff employees, known as the Madoff Five, are also in some trouble. They all plead not guilty to their numerous crimes and face a joint trial. After almost six months, on March 24th, 2014, the jury finds them guilty on all 31 combined counts. They each face spending the rest of their lives behind bars, but none of them get anything near that. They do, however, need to forfeit a ton of money which they obviously don't have. A combined $384 billion, to be exact. In February of 2020, Madoff asks the courts if he can be released early due to having kidney failure and 18 months to live. Because he was a bit too naughty as a free man, they deny his request. Madoff's assets were liquidated, lawsuits were filed, but Picard and his team still aren't done. They want all of the money back and now they have to go after the smaller investors. In September of 2020, a court orders that anyone who profited from the scheme must give all of the money back. During his time in prison, Madoff worked as prisoners do. He earned a monumental 24 cents an hour for his labor. In the days leading up to his death, he was missing eight teeth, had lost two toes, and was hallucinating. On April 24, 2021, Madoff died in federal prison from natural causes at the age of 82. He died the proud owner of eight AAA batteries, four paperback religious books, a calculator, four packages of popcorn, a cup of ramen soup, and a box of Geffeld fish. So, what else happened? Well, as of December 2022, Picard and his team have crawled back over $14 billion. This is absolutely insane considering how little they were expected to get back in the beginning. Following the federal investigation, the SEC cleaned up its act and passed several reforms to make sure that something like this never happens again. And there you have it, the 2008 Blemis investment scandal. What can we learn from this? A couple things. First, do not start a Ponzi scheme, you won't get away with it. That is not a challenge. Second, I know it's cliche, but if it sounds too good to be true, it, prob it probably is. Be careful who you entrust your money to and do your due, dil due, 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 due diligence before making large financial decisions. Anyways, I have a great investment opportunity for 